Chapter 18 After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that he had spoken, I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who advised who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfil what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Chapter 19 Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw it, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered the headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the Place of the Skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, 
Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfil the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Jesus says, For whom are you looking? John 18, verse 4. The first words of Jesus in John's Gospel are, what are you looking for? The first words of Jesus in the Passion narrative are, For whom are you looking? The former question, what are you looking for, is addressed to those who are hungry for God, hungry for life, for new life. Such people are around today. We, I hope, are such people. The latter question, for whom are you looking, is addressed to those who want to extinguish the life that Jesus brings, who have come to arrest him and have him killed. Such people are around today. We too can be such people, resisting or rejecting the new life he comes to give us. So these questions are for us today on Good Friday. Hear Jesus' first question spoken to you personally. What are you looking for? Ask yourself, what am I looking for? What matters most to me? Is it actually my kingdom come, my will be done, 
a life lived on my terms with me in the driving seat. Now hear Jesus' latter question, for whom are you looking? Am I looking for a God in my image, a God on my terms, a God to suit me, a God to bless my plans for my life, a God who will not disturb me, challenge me or change me? The Passion Narrative asks profound questions of us all as we encounter afresh the depth of God's self-giving love. Those coming to arrest Jesus in the Kidron Valley answer his question, Jesus of Nazareth, to which Jesus responds, I am he, as translations put it. What he actually says in John's Gospel is, I am ego eimi, the very name of God, the unmentionable, awesome name of God. And so John tells us they fall to the ground in awe at the name. This is the twelfth of the I am sayings in John's Gospel, but this one is different. Earlier, the I am sayings of Jesus have an object. For example, I am the bread of life, or I am the light of the world, or I am the way, the truth and the life or I am the Good Shepherd. Then he was teaching, he was guiding, he was inspiring, he was initiating. Now it is different. He has been handed over, betrayed. Here in the Passion narrative we see the Good Shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. He is no longer in control. Before this moment, he was doing. From now on, he is being done too. Some of you will know the classic book by W.H. Vanston from the 80s, The Stature of Waiting. The pivotal theme is the handed overness of Jesus. Paul writes, God handed over his son for us all. Here Jesus is betrayed by Judas and handed over to humanity, those coming to arrest him and take him away. At the same time, he is handing over his own life to God as he always is doing. His dying words as recorded by Luke are, into your hands I commend my spirit. Vanston argues that every Christian life should involve both of these things. First, agency, choosing what we do and say, taking responsibility, initiating, having some control over our lives. Second, and crucially, which is an apt word in the circumstances, our lives will be and will need to be handed over handed over to God, and indeed at times handed over to others. We need to experience times and places in our lives when we are not in control, when we are dependent, dependent on others and dependent on the grace and mercy of God, which of course we are all of the time. In fact, this latter dimension of surrendering our lives to God should be a mark of our daily discipleship, called as we are to take up our cross daily. In times such as these, in this very time, in this pandemic, most of us have no choice in the matter. We are confined, we are at least physically isolated, that is most of us. We're experiencing most uncomfortably, a loss of agency. We want and we feel we need to be doing things, 
And for most of us, that means doing things to help. So I was not surprised, and it was warming, that in response to the government's request for 150,000 NHS volunteers, over 600,000 responded. And we all know and can see in our own parish communities huge numbers of volunteers offering to serve the needy in pastoral and practical ways. This is good and of God. Now back in the Kidron Valley, Jesus has been betrayed and handed over, and in the midst of his enforced passivity, he is still giving, he is still emptying himself in love. He says to his captors, if you are looking for me, let these men go. John goes on, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. John speaks of his disciples, and that means you and I today, as, quotes, those you have given me. As a disciple, you are a gift to Jesus. Have you ever thought of that? You are a gift to Jesus. You matter to him. Believe it. Listen, you are chosen and precious in my sight, and I love you, says the Lord. Do you believe that? Do you dare to believe it? Henri Nouwen describes original sin as humanity's endless capacity for self-rejection. Today is all about the passionate love of Christ for you, for the world for which he died. The love of God in Christ that is witnessed in the passion and death of Christ. This is how much he loves us. This is the heart of it all. This is what matters. This is ultimately the only thing that matters. Can we put ourselves in, a, in the position to see this, to hear this, to receive this? Can we wake up from our anaesthesia? Can we wake out of sleep? Paul writes, now is the time to wake out of sleep. Now, this moment. It might be the sleep of apathy or indifference to which we have inadvertently succumbed. I think of Studdick Kennedy, First World War Padre, known as Woodbine Willie, who lived out as a chaplain in the First War the incarnational principle, Christ right there in the trenches on the front line with the men who are dying. In the war, in the midst of death and the precariousness of every moment in the trenches, the men were more than open to God. They had to face ultimate realities. Will I be alive tomorrow? Will I be alive in an hour's time? Today, with this deadly pandemic, more and more people are aware of the precariousness, precariousness of life and the possible closeness of death. God, I believe, is using that in his economy to draw people more deeply to a sense of life as a gift, a gift of God, and into a sense of God's love and mercy. After the war, Studdick Kennedy, the Padre, recognised something perhaps more dangerous and insidious to Christian life and faith than closeness of death. He recognised the danger of apathy and indifference. Writing a poem which I encourage you to look up and read, when Jesus came to Birmingham, they simply passed him by. Crucifixion not by opposition, but by apathy. And we too can succumb to that, especially in the comfortable West. So a question for us on this Good Friday. Can we, can you, can I break free 
from the captivity in which we've been held, the captivity perhaps of ap apathy, the captivity of consumerist Christianity, Christ on my terms, the captivity of what T.S. Eliot calls living and only partly living. Can we open our ears to hear Christ addressing us personally, addressing us corporately, reproaching us perhaps for our lack of response to his love? From the reproaches, my people, what wrong have I done to you? What good have I not done to you? See Jesus on the cross. What more could God do to show us his love. Good Friday is indeed good. It is the overflowing of the goodness of God. So let us know ourselves in that overflowing of the passionate love of God in Christ. And let us let that love overflow through us into the world we inhabit.